65 years ago that the first African American was even allowed to be a member of the then Jefferson County Medical Society. The fact that I am now going to be the president of this doesn't say so much about me, but the fact that all of us, no matter the race and or sex or creed as physicians, have a lot to offer to our community. One of my instructors used to always say, at the end of the day, we should ask two questions. Number one, what did I do that I shouldn't have done? And what didn't I do that I should have done? Mm. And I don't want to ever come up short on my answer of saying I did not follow through on an opportunity to take care of a patient, to okay. talk to another individual, or to take the opportunity to learn something new. So I think that's the thing that kind of pushes me forward. SSC Live TV is proud to welcome Dr. Wayne Tuxen to the set of G3. Hi, I'm Betty Baye, and welcome to this edition of G3, Good Greet, Good Gossip, Good God. And this is a show where we talk about issues that are important to us as women and also just as African-American men, women, and children. And let me introduce you to my road dogs, Letty Jo Johnson. Hello. And Gwen Bashir. Hello, and welcome to the show. And today we have a special guest, and we're talking about a woman named Henrietta Lacks. Maybe you heard her name, but you're going to know more about her before this show is over. And our guest today is Dr. Wayne Tuxen, who is my doctor. But Wayne, why don't you tell them what you do? Because doctors have long titles and degrees and all of that. I'm going to keep it real short. I'm a colon and rectal surgeon. Um, biggest thing for me is I'm out of Washington, D.C., trained at Howard University, undergrad, medical school, and did almost all of my surgical training there. So HBCU H -H all the way through. HBCU all day. <laughs> and, uh, but no, and, uh, but again, being a colon and rectal surgeon, one thing I'll say, one of the things we do are colonoscopies. You've had your colonoscopy, <laughs> and I encourage everybody to make sure that if they're over 45, they need to get a colonoscopy so we can screen for colon and rectal cancer. Absolutely. Yes, and that is an issue in our community. It is. Now, now, I mentioned the name of the person we want to really focus on tonight, and that is a woman named Henrietta Lacks, who was in Baltimore, Maryland in 1951, mm -hmm. and she had cervical cancer. And we know that that is also an issue in our community, cervical cancer. And they took cells from her body. She apparently had these amazing cells that could do what other people's cells did not do. Wayne, tell me something about the mother of the HeLa cells. Uh, it, it, it's a really interesting story. Miss Lacks, who until, well really, her name was really kept secret for a long period of time. In fact, they had it wrong for a long time. But Miss Lacks developed a cancer called squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, or at least that's what they thought that it is. It is one of the most common cancers that occurs in women, and it occurs in high frequency to this day. The interesting thing, to some degree it may be preventable, surely we can decrease the incidence, but it definitely can be diagnosed early by using a pap smear. And the, mm, it's amazing at the number of women today who aren't getting pap smears for many, many different reasons. Sometimes it's men, especially if you're out in the uh, real rural parts of a state like Kentucky, where the men are the dominant figures, they mm -hmm. won't let their wives have a pap smear, be examined by a gynecologist. Mm -hmm. uh, but here in the city, sometimes it's just availability or actually people going out and get it. But anyway, so she had a, a cervical cancer. There's a couple of sad things about her story. Um, number one, she complained about being sick for a long time and her physicians ignored it. And I think that's important because even today, sometimes, particularly mm -hmm. in the African American community, yes. mm -hmm. right. healthcare workers minimize complaints, particularly pain. When you come down to someone complaining of pain, ah, oh, pain seeking behavior mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. And that was true back then. But the thing that was important is that her cancer was diagnosed six months after she delivered, a vaginal delivery, oh. six months afterwards. Now, the reason I say that is because that cancer was there during all those prenatal wow. examinations that she had. 
they just didn't pay attention to what was going on. And she told them something was wrong down there. The year before she was diagnosed, she said. So uh, point being, even during examination, because she was an African-American, her complaints were minimized, and the findings that they looked at, they just at all. This and is just some this infection. notion that black people are, are are impervious to pain, like we don't right, really right. have pain, like like other people. Yes. Well, well, the other thing that's interesting is around that time, the concept of African Americans getting cancer really wasn't that well known. It wasn't until a paper in about 1971 or late 60s written by a guy named Ulrich Hensky in LaSalle LaFall at Howard University pointed out that yes, in fact, African Americans are getting cancers at high rates. It was thought that that was an infrequent thing that would occur in African Americans. Mm -hmm. Very similar, they used to say that we didn't get polio either. Mm -hmm. But we now know African Americans got polio too. Yeah. So the fact that so you put all this stuff together that one, not pain, Mm -hmm. Don't think the African Americans get cancer and that this thing was missed. She didn't have to die from her disease. If she had been diagnosed when she first presented, now, that would have been bad. Now, one of the things she did do that was that because of the nature of where she was mm -hmm. and thinking, one of the things people tend to do sometimes, they minimize their symptoms. I'm going to tell you right now, if you got blood coming out of any other part of your body besides if you, you, know, you get cut, from a vein or an artery, that's a problem. You need to see that. She did not go in right away when those symptoms first presented themselves. But she went in, things were pretty early on in the course mm -hmm. of events. And with the standard treatment that was available back there in the 50s, early 1950, 1949, she could have been saved. Now, the hospital that she went to, or the, the, the doctors that she saw, were they, was this a African-American facility or was this a facility that treated all patients? Was it something that had to do with her color mm -hmm. or was it just the fact that it, it was just undetected? You know, in, in the book, uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lack, written by Rebecca Sklott, I think. Sklott, Sklott. And it was a bestseller it, too. And it should have been. She yeah. went, she documents a lot of things. She, uh, Ms. Lacks went to Johns Hopkins University Hospital, which even then was a big, yes, right, in Baltimore. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was a okay. big name facility. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing about Johns Hopkins, and it's Johns Hopkins, that's the full name, mm -hmm. the S is on the name. Johns Hopkins was a businessman in Baltimore who in, and I want to make sure I get this right for you, in uh, I think it was 1860, 1871, thereabouts, he donated $7 million to start a medical school and charity hospital for, and I quote, the indigent, the indigent sick of the city and its environs without regard to sex, age, or color, who uh, require surgical or medical treatment, who can be received into the hospital without peril to other inmates in the, in the hospital, and the poor of the city and state of all races who are stricken down by any casualty shall be received without charge. Now, why is that important? Johns Hopkins owned slaves up to 1865 wow. and he may have been trying to have <clears throat> some you know mm -hmm. clear his conscience yes. Yes. you know so mm -hmm. it's interesting that he did mm -hmm. that now mm -hmm. even though this is how the hospital was set up like every other hospital in the United States at that time mm -hmm. there were segregated wards there right. were you know and this didn't mm -hmm. change until the late 60s when you had Medicare coming yeah. mm -hmm. so you had black or what they said colored in mm -hmm. those days because yes. there was a colored yes. entrance yes. at Hopkins mm -hmm. and then you had the one for white mm -hmm. and so African Americans got secondhand treatment. If you remember, W.B. Du Bois' son died yeah. in the basement yeah. of a hospital waiting to be seen once the white physician got through seeing all of the white patients. Mm -hmm. Then he went down there and saw his son who wow. died from mm -hmm. diarrhea, dehydration, and, and, all sorts and, of things. And, and let me just say, yeah. the reason why we're talking about Henrietta Lacks, why it came up again, is because her family recently filed suit uh, led by Crump, Attorney Crump, your friend, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> who, uh, because everybody's been using herself, yeah. and the family is saying, look, we ought to get some benefit from this, yeah. from our mother's self. So that's why it was recently in the news. Yeah. So a lawsuit has been filed where the family is trying to get some of the residuals. But, but what about Wayne, how much money? I mean, is there really money that's been made off of herself over the years? Well, or what has it framed, right? What has it amplified as a result of her enduring all of what she's gone mm -hmm. through? What does that now, what, what does that speak to, right? Medical physicians, the stakeholders that are yes. engaged in mm -hmm. that. Well, when you go back and look at from Hopkins itself, um, 
the original guy who cultured, his name was G G G E Y, if I remember correctly. He did not profit one bit from, at least from the cells themselves. He, Hopkins developed a cell line. He developed a lot of other instrumentation. He was not a wealthy man and he did not profit from that. So if you go back and look at, did Hopkins get money from this? Well, not directly, but those cells were sent to a lot of other mm -hmm. places and many of them were commercial ventures which did profit from this. And we're talking billions of dollars. As I said, this, almost every drug that you can think of that is out there right now has been tested or developed in these cells. Probably the some cosmetic. In the well, I, I got to say, uh, you know, I'm not going to say healer. Okay. Now, in, in the healer came about because the way cell cultures were named, you took the first two letters of the first name and the first two letters of the last name. So Henrietta Lacks, H-E-L-A, mm -hmm. -E hence HeLa. Okay. okay. So I mean, so that was the nomenclature that was used for this. But yeah. So what happened then is, so you have now prestige though. So when you you mentioned you know money, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you have the prestige of Johns Hopkins. Well, clearly that elevated this institution because of all the research that they were able to do. I'm joined now by Ben Crump, one of the family's attorneys, and Ron Lax, Henrietta's grandson. And Mr. Lax, thank you so much for being here. I just want to put up for the audience just some of the things that your grandmother's cells have helped to advance. Everything from the polio vaccines, understanding x-rays in the human cells, um, trying to understand the ineffectivity of Ebola and HIV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When did your family find out that your grandmother was the source of all of those scientific miracles? Decades. <laughs> yeah. My, my mother was the one that found out and threw it by accident. She was having lunch with a friend of hers down the street. And her neighbor introduced her as Barbette Lax. And he told her, we're working with someone named Henrietta Lax. And she told him, that's my mother-in-law. And that's how we found out. You know, Ben, there's a sense of the dehumanization of black bodies and black life here where she, while a human being with a life, that's why we try to describe some of her life, was just treated as a product that could be bought and sold and disposed of at, at will by a company, um, this company, Thermo Official Scientific, and by Johns Hopkins. It's, 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 a, it's a wild sort of uh, reality that, you know, black life was treated this way. What do you hope to gain from this lawsuit? What do you think will be gained? Well, obviously, Henrietta Lacks' uh, miraculous cells were unprecedented. So we know that this would be a precedent set in lawsuit, not just for simple justice, not just for social justice, but for genetic justice, Joy Reid, justice that will flow from generation to generation. And when you think about Henrietta Lacks being treated in this just inhumane manner, as if she was a lab rat, which was very common at the time when they did medical experimentation. What it was tantamount to was medical racism. But through all that evil, we have this miraculous discovery of this black woman who cells have become the cornerstone of modern medicine. And every pharmaceutical corporation in the world has made billions and billions of dollars, yet her family has not made one red cent. And what we're saying in this lawsuit, they have the right to define her legacy, to benefit from her legacy, and to pass her legacy on to their generations of children yet unborn because her life mattered. You know, there's a there's a there's a feeling almost like this is sort of an, uh, another way that slavery operated, right, Mr. Lax? That you know that your grandmother, while human, was just seen as you know Ben Crump said as a product that could just be bought and sold, and that her family was owed nothing. It, it's shocking to me that that. that Johns Hopkins, was there any communication at the time with your grandmother 
to say to her, you know, you have miraculous cells or something miraculous about you. Would you be interested in any way in, in joining? I mean, I don't know. I know black people weren't even treated in most hospitals. Did her doctors communicate with, with her at all what they were doing? Not, not at all. Matter of fact, my grandfather told the story of so many doctors coming into her room was strange to them, period. You know, okay. that she was getting so much attention. A black person didn't get that much attention back then. So they knew something was wrong then, yeah. but never explained why. It's it's shocking. And so j just for those who are watching, this is the HeLa cell. They call it, they literally named it after her. So they, they were like hiding in plain sight. It's called the H-E-L-A, which stands for Henrietta Lacks. So the lawsuit bid is asking the court to order Thermo Fisher Scientific to disgorge the full amount of its net profits obtained by commercializing the HeLa cells. Do you have any idea sort of what those profits have been over the years in total? Well, we don't know, but we know Thermo Fisher alone, this distributor of the sales reported a profit of $33 billion last year. And that's not to say what Merck, Pharmaceutical, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, I mean, it's billions upon billions. And that's when you think about George Floyd this past year and how the corporations all made these pledges to social justice. Well, a lot of them were pharmaceutical companies as well. So if you want to honor that pledge, well, do right finally by Henrietta Lacks. And then you wonder why black people don't trust the medical establishment and why we have to beg and plead with people to get vaccinated. They don't trust the system. These are the reasons that people don't trust it. Y'all, there is a real reason people don't have trust. Ben Crump and Ron Lacks, thank you both very much. We are the G3. Good grief, good gossip, good God. And on our next episode, we'll be talking about violence against black women. And we're back with Dr. Wayne Tuxen talking about the case of Henrietta Lacks. And uh, Dr. Tuxen, you said before the break, you were talking about the, the universities and how people benefited from yeah. Henrietta Lacks' So health. Henrietta, and this kind of gets into what does the Johns Hopkins or anybody else owe to Henrietta? How do you determine the value? Mm -hmm. I want to say about a couple of examples, if I may. Georgetown University in uh, 1838. They had 272 enslaved individuals, men, women, and children, that they sold. Now, right. these are the Jesuits, who, and these people were working on the Jesuit farm in Maryland. They sold them because they need to raise money to keep Georgetown University from going under. Mm -hmm. And they did. They sold these people literally, figuratively, down the river, down wow. to Louisiana. And they're just trying to make it up now. And they're just trying to make it. So what scholarships. And, mm -hmm. and, but mm -hmm. Georgetown hadn't really done much. Mm -hmm. Because there was a, the students wanted to have a thing where there was an added $27 20 cent fee for 2720, mm -hmm. uh, 272 uh, onto the uh, tuition, but the student, other students voted down. The university said they were going to come up with some money, but they weren't going to put in their own money, and they were trying to get philanthropy to put in the money. What's interesting when you think about what do black folks contributed to Georgetown University? If you've ever seen that basketball team, it's all black. It brings in over $13 million <laughs> yeah. a year. And this school don't want to do nothing for those right. people. Now, there's another school, Virginia Theological Seminary. They also had slaves. They have a $1.7 million reparations fund. They're covering families of people. Princeton Theological Seminary is putting out $27 million in scholarships wow. because they also had slaves, so mm. to family members who were slaves. Now, the question comes in, what has Johns Hopkins done? Not a darn thing. Wow. They have not done, they haven't offered to provide education for the Lack family. They haven't even offered to provide health care my to the lack family. Sense. You think that, that would is. be the reasonable thing the, to least. do. And in yeah. fact, in the book, she ends it by talking about family members who are sick mm -hmm. can't afford health care. Mm -hmm. wow. You would think the very least with what is known about Henrietta Lacks and the HeLa cells and all that it meant to Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. they'd at least treat the family for free. And they won't even do that. And her descendants, they are the ones who are, you know, suing and saying, mm -hmm. wait a minute, because they took this woman's use herself without her permission. I mean, right. she didn't know what was going on. Oh. And, 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 and what about Letty, in terms of just black women and our general health, and we were talking about the cervical cancer thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I remember Dr. Adewale Troutman would always talk about culturally competent That's right. physicians. That's right. All of my main doctors are black. 
all of them. But I can remember people saying, I'm not going to a black doctor because somehow they have this notion that black doctors are not as qualified or, or well, whatever. Well, it's a small community as yeah. well, right? Yeah. So we think about it, you know, you know well, if I, I'm, I'm afraid if I go to this doctor, right? It's a myth, but I'm afraid if I go to this doctor, then everybody's going right. to know my business. My business yeah, is going to be out in the street. Yeah. of the doctor because yeah. they know the family and they know the friends and they go to the same mm -hmm. church and mm -hmm. all those type of things. So they feel like they're not going to mm -hmm. get that confidentiality that they might get from the guy that doesn't look like them who lives across care. town. Right. Well, well, what about uh, Dr. Tuxin? When we go to the doctor, when I get up on the table and I'm doing a pap or I'm, you know, having my, you know, examinations, I don't know what they're doing. You know, I'm not seeing what they're doing down there. I mean, is it possible that still that stuff is being taken from us that we don't know that we're being uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, our cells are being used? How do we know or do we don't know? There, there are a couple of things that came about from the, the episode involving Henrietta Lacks. Number one, there was this thing called the Nuremberg Code. And mm -hmm. what the Nuremberg Code was to address uh, experimentation on people without their willingness to participate. Mm -hmm. You remember what the Nazis were doing. Yes, and right. so this was set up. Funny, you know, American docs said, well, that doesn't apply to us. That only applies to despots authoritarianism, mm, yeah. dictators, mm -hmm. and all that. But no, actually it does. What happened, because when the first word got out about what was happening as far as the healer cells and the fact that there was no, inf nobody told the family about what was going on, mm -hmm. informed consent suddenly became mm -hmm. the thing. And that's when you start hearing about this. Uh, National Institutes of Health came out and said, wait a minute, we saw all this stuff. We, and they said, anyone who does any study funded by us must show us that you've sat down and gotten permission from people and you tell them mm -hmm. what actually is going on. And you know, the other thing that led to this was the United States Public Health Service Tuskegee study on syf untreated mm -hmm. syphilis mm -hmm. in Negro men. Now, I want you to remember that. The full title is United States Public mm -hmm. Health Service Tuskegee study on untreated syphilis in Negro men. Don't just say Tuskegee stuff. Mm -hmm. You got to put that United States because that's States. what the families want to say. Mm -hmm. It remind us all. And there was no informed consent. And what was the consequence of this? Not only did these men not get treated for syphilis and die, but their family their members family. became infected. Right. That, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 is the mental implication of the, the, the man not being treated properly, the woman not being treated properly, what has it done to the black family? Yeah. I think the number one thing, you guys touched on it already. Mm -hmm. There, you go in and you say, what is this person about to do to me? That was your question. What are they doing? So the, the answer to your question is, you have to think, I have a wife, I have a son. My approach is, and the way I learned it, do I want someone to do to them, am I going to do to them what I don't want somebody else to do? Mm -hmm. I have to treat you just like I want someone mm -hmm. to treat my family mm -hmm. member. And we have to talk to patients. So now, what has come about this, we have this tremendous distrust in the African American yes. community mm -hmm. for the healthcare providers. Yes. How has this been manifest? Unfortunately, COVID-19, yes. you see this tremendous mistrust that we have had over the entire process. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, I have great faith in the process, how it's gone on. Mm -hmm. But you got a lot of people that keep coming back to the United States Public Health Service Tuskegee study. And you have this thing as far as HeLa. It has eroded. Plus, this sort of thing where you have this second class or backhand treatment is not an unusual event mm -hmm. in our experiences. I think most of us can say, well, you know, you go someplace where the doctor didn't treat you well. Like right. you said, mm -hmm. the yes. thing about pain. Now, if you, God forbid if you're an African American with sickle cell, mm -hmm. as we tend to get, yeah. mm -hmm. these poor people are suffering because people don't want to acknowledge mm -hmm. the problem mm -hmm. that they are having mm -hmm. pain. Mm -hmm. So it does impact. So what happens? We wind up showing up later for health care when diseases are more advanced, mm -hmm. when the complications are higher, and the risk of dying is also higher. Mm -hmm. And that presents itself as a real problem. We just don't have that trust in the person who's taking care of us. Mm -hmm. It is somewhat obviated when we look like, you know, someone looks, walks, talks, and feels like you. Sure. That mm -hmm. makes it a lot better. But sometimes, as you pointed out, sometimes our folk don't want to go to our folk. Let's right. face it. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, we don't mm -hmm. trust our own folks. And so mm -hmm. let's talk about that for just a moment because we have so many women and young girls and even men listening to us right now. Let's talk about when do we need to start for women and 
because Henrietta Lacks had cervical cancer that could have been she could have been saved. At what point do women need to start thinking about these type mm -hmm. of doctor's visits? And is there an age where we no longer need to do that? How often does it need to happen? And and those type of things so that we can educate our viewers to let them know that you have to do it, have faith in the system, and these are some of the rules or regulations or best practices mm -hmm. to keep in mind for this. Well, let's take the Henry, Henrietta Lacks thing first. Mm -hmm. It wasn't known then, her, because of her husband, who was by all stretch of imagination, not a good guy, mm -hmm. but she had had histories of gonorrhea and syphilis repeatedly, mm -hmm. and these impacted her. But wow. the most important thing was, and they didn't find this out to much later on a specimen of hers that was around long after she died, mm -hmm. she also had human papillomavirus. The number one HPV. cause of cervical cancer is HPV, human papillomavirus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to answer your question directly, when should a woman start getting gynecologic exams? Definitely when she becomes sexually active. Mm -hmm. I don't care what age that is. Right. Mm -hmm. she had, then when you start talking, when women start going through having menses and things, mm -hmm. again, they need to start going through these examinations so that what is normal can all be talked about. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think is important before women and men, before they become sexually active, Got to get the human papillomavirus vaccine. It's called mm -hmm. Gardasil. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it is. A, and they do it, it at 11 years old, they right? Can, they can start at 11 mm -hmm. years old. So you they say, don't oh, have it later. They say, oh, I don't want my sweet baby to get this. 90% mm -hmm. of people who are sexually active in the United States will test positive for HPV. Yeah. Oh, and very do you common. have to request this particular? Yes, uh, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to request that vaccine. And so women are going to get the pap smears starting at that young age. You're going to go ahead and start getting those pap smears again. Because you're looking for, there are some changes that will go along with the human papillomavirus that you can pick up. Again, the problem is human papillomavirus is associated with cancers. Mm -hmm. And that's one of these things that you can mm -hmm. pick up. So that's when. And is there a time that a woman should stop? I mean, as we get older in, t in, no. in age, I mean, you should always, you should no. do this for I'm as never long gonna as stop. Right? Like, yeah. You know, sometimes I'm you get older and, and, and more, more, more seasoned, we're and you're like, oh, well, I, 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 I'm good this far, so let's just, you know. And that, that is a good question. Start uh, or stop, yeah. right? Yeah. Stop yeah. or start, yeah. right? Yeah, so stopping, you know, I mean, there are some things you might not need to look at quite as mm -hmm. vigorously, but still, I think the routine examinations uh, the pap smear is still good. Yes. Looking for blood in the stool. Yes. Uh, these things are still good. Colonoscopies every Colon 10 years. And, yes. and, and then you get to a point, though, <laughs> you say, well, if you haven't had anything, you know, if you're still a young person yeah. like Betty, yes. you're going to live to be 150. <laughs> yeah, you need to get that sort of thing. But there are some times, but that's a discussion you have with mm -hmm. your doctor about mm -hmm. what kind of condition yeah. you're in. But these diseases are that weak. It's, the thing is, there are some cancers that, in this case, in, like with healing, as I said, because of the human papillomavirus, there are certain cancers you can identify early. Well, Breast, prostate, not in women, prostate yeah. men, cervical <laughs> cancer, and colon cancer. Well, we're going to, on that note, we've got to stop, but we really love Dr. Tuxton. We've gotten a lot of information. we got to give a good gossip on top of this, because besides him being the good gossip, let him, do you have a good gossip for us? I, I do, I do. Our good gossip today is if we never tell our stories, we will never know our history. Our legacy will be lost and it would be bound to repeat itself. Well, Amen. I think that is true. History Good. repeats itself. You know, if you yes. don't know what you're doing, you're down, bound to do it again. Absolutely. And, mm. and, and, and let's just say that again, um, the idea of the G3 is to give information, not just to the people of our church, but to the people out there who yes. watch us all the time. And Dr. Tuxen, you have been so informative Absolutely. and given people things to think about. And I think that as a church, as church folk, we really need to make sure that we have these things all posted. You know, get right. your exams, you know, get your tests, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I know that St. Stephen has been real good about offering testing and vaccines mm -hmm. and we have health fairs and stuff. Absolutely. But we do have the opportunity to get more information. So Wayne Tuxton, I want to thank you. How can they, how can people yes. reach you? Through Betty. <laughs> well, I'm going to Thank you, and we're gonna go. Thank you. <laughs>